All right, so welcome everyone to this upcoming conversation session on academic ontologies. My name is Joaquin Lapuz. I am the web content coordinator of the Humanities Across Borders program, and I'd like to welcome uh, our speakers, Anita Silvia, Min Tang, uh, Omar Rodriguez to a wonderful conversation about mapping as research strategy. So a few uh, a few rules before we head into the conversation proper. Um, we will have a uh, open discussion after all of our speakers have shared their presentations about using maps as a research strategy. Uh, this is where you'll be able to ask any questions or comments that you have towards our audience. And if you do have anything of the sort, please use the chat and we will read it out for our speakers to uh, speakers to answer or comment on. So, uh, and this uh, this meeting will be recorded, but please note uh, the reason why I asked uh, everyone to turn off their videos is so that the only people who are caught on the recording are our speakers. So, to give some opening remarks and to lead us into our conversation session, I'd like to introduce the Academic Director of the Humanities Across Borders Program of IES, uh, Arti Kalra. So Arti, please take it away. So, hello everyone. Welcome to the Academic Ontologies online conversation series. Uh, this is a series that we initiated here uh, for students and early career scholars interested in innovative research strategies grounded in lived experience. Um, and it's a collaboration between the Humanities Across Borders program of the IAS and the fellowship program of the IAS uh, here in Leiden. We are zooming in from Leiden in the Netherlands. Um, and unfortunately, our fellowship coordinator, who usually is with us, uh, Laura Erber, has taken ill and unfortunately will not be with us. So um, I'd like to uh, share with you a little bit about this uh, online platform. Um, this is a platform which offers an open space for coming together of a transdisciplinary online network for sharing intersectional multilingual narrative research and teaching strategies for a next generation of scholarship. We recognize the limitations of, teach, uh, of the predominantly English language based colonial and post-colonial modalities of textual production of knowledge within academe today. Our aim therefore is to draw attention to what has been left out namely non-textual forms of expression like storytelling, both oral and visual, and embodied practices, performances as legitimate modes of knowledge making and learning through being in the world. Uh, last year, when we commenced this series, we discussed the narrative tools of storytelling and place-based belonging as discursive strategies for community enmeshed research. In this third session of academic ontologies, we will focus on the practice of mapping in its diverse articulations. In particular, we will see uh, how walking, drawing, rereading, and redrawing offer opportunities for counter mapping in the company of local or indigenous interlocutors. Alternative cartography serves as a valuable resource for artists, scholars, architects, and designers to collaborate with those who inhabit these spaces and to reveal hidden narratives and spatial temporal connections beyond authorized colonial and post-colonial discourses of the city, of urban planning, of developmental nationalism, of heritage, conservation, and climate change. All three speakers today speak of maps that challenge conventional, often Eurocentric and even nationalistic map-making practices to decenter the city center. 
they shed light on overlooked or overwritten micro histories, activist agendas, and practices of solidarity and or violence at the intersecies of urban neighborhoods and land and water ecologies visualized one map at a time in the making of cities. And with this, I'd like to open the conversation between Anita, Min, and Omar. So welcome. So the, uh, uh, would you like to share with us how we will do this? Um, yeah. So everyone, I will, um, we'll start with some presentations from our lovely, our lovely speakers. They'll talk about each of their, uh, each of their experiences. And then after that, we'll have a discussion uh, amongst them and then open that up to the rest of the audience. So to start, Anita, would you, would you mind starting us off? Okay. Thank you, Joaquin. Thank you, RT. Thank you, everyone. It's really nice to see um, some of uh, familiar names here. Uh, nice to meet you online. <laughs> and also new, lots of new names. So uh, welcome to this uh, platform. This is also my first time on this platform join. So it's my honor and I'm really, I'm really excited actually to uh, be part of the platform itself. So all for today's presentations, I will share my recent work. Actually, I really work. I work at this uh, events. Uh, it's a workshop and exhibition in one kampung in Surabaya. And I um, work as a program manager. So this is also part of my work as a program manager. So in the in the same time, I do the, um, I, in the same time, I like naturally, I do the mapping to for to make it happen the events. So let me share the. Um, it has only happened last March, start last March until I guess it's end of the May. Uh, end of this May, um, that uh, me and uh, our small team and also the artists uh, start to work together with uh, Kampung uh, residents. This is the Kampung Pampitan residents in Surabaya. Um, I believe, I guess, most of uh, most of the audience today not yet visit Surabaya, but please next time visit us Surabaya. So this I want to um, let's go. Let's go man. This one, this is like the, um, really want to show you where's the Plumpitan it is. This is like the old colonial, the colonial maps in 1940s. So uh, this is uh, by the Dutch um, uh, municipal in Surabaya. So we can see like this one, the Plumpitan on this, um, on this map, Plumpitan. This is actually, it's a very, um, interesting name for uh, for a kampung, and this um uh, this kampung is uh, considered the old neighborhood in Surabaya. Um, like some of the um, uh, archaeological findings is uh, since like 14th century, and some of the um, old tomb in 15th century. So this um um uh, but it's very hard to find archive or um, or comprehensive story about this uh, old neighborhood uh, because most of the history or archive is mostly on the well, colonial buildings, not the kampung. I mean, even the kampung also, they um, the archive mostly related to the, um, the, uh, the program, colonial government program that impose uh, to the kampong. So it's a, uh, so this with this even uh, March until May this year, it is fairly actually rare opportunity for us, for even for myself as um, someone already lived in Surabaya for 20 years. It's very rare to us to have this access to the kampong or even to uh, have a chance to learn more about the sites. Um, as you see, the site is very significant. It's like confluence from 
um, not called, I guess it's a quite brands. It's brands from the Surabaya River. This is south and north. It's uh, the brands of the Two River, uh, Mass River, and also Pagiri and River. So this um, uh, so this like the um, it's very we can say it's very sacred intersections. So from this uh, intersection is uh, I believe even like uh, I can see the map. This is will be very. Uh, important uh, sites with this um, uh, between these two main river, Mass River and also Paguan River. So uh, as, as you can see also from the map, we can see the huge uh, Panele um, cemetery. This is that um, cemetery um, um, since it's only in uh, early 19th century. So it is new, considered a new uh, cemetery, modern cemetery. Um, but before um, way of the death cemetery, there's already like uh, uh, desperate scattered of the cemetery uh, surround the kampung. So that's some um, that's someone want to show you the where the kampung panela is. And one thing also maybe in the modern time of Surabaya in this area is this that the the new CBD um just in 1910 so around this one the gentang tunjungan street um uh, most of us Surabaya also know this tunjungan street is very famous in our uh, city's memories until now we have the song but tunjungan we have the um, um well right now we have the very uh, fancy uh, pavement along the tunjungan street with the a fancy shopping mall also. So this only cross the street, there is the kampong, which is totally makes different uh, atmosphere with the CBD of Surabaya. So this is welcome to the kampong Kampitan. So this is like one of the entrance of the kampong Kampitan. Even like uh, this, a notion of the kampung and also notion of the prampitan also have like still like on discourse like i'm actually i'm very happy to have uh, to follow the discourse about the kampung urban kampung in indonesia maybe you some of you already know abidin kusno precolombian probably peters uh, many scholar uh global so also abdul like simon also have a more like every year have a more discourse about this kampung uh, especially for urban kampung. So in Surabaya, um, this is one of the best um, sites to learn about urban kampung in Indonesia. So it's, um, uh, that's why I, I said before, this is like important or rare opportunity for us, um, independent scholar, even artists, even local people in Surabaya to learn about this, uh, the site, uh, the important um, sites of uh, our city, uh, the kampung. So um, another interesting uh, findings, early findings uh, of this kampung that I um, also recognized in a few years recently, that this, um, this kampung uh, have like um, a more than uh, 10 alley, 10 alleyways, and they has like one of the oldest and the longest uh, pedestrian alley, or we can say car-free, car-free alley. So, and also we have the trace of the logo since colonial time. This one, the logo of the um, uh, only uh, there's no car allowed on this alley. So this uh, this signage is uh, produced by the uh, Surabaya Municipal um, um, in I guess in the start in early 1920s and then become like still we still using the uh, the government municipal government right now still using these signage, but the um, uh, locals right now uh, already make more signage to to keep this um what's called to keep this um uh, tradition um norms uh, uh, in Ali of Surabaya. And as unfortunately, Surabaya, even like we are the second biggest city in Indonesia, we have we we are very lack of the public transportations. It's 
totally different with Jakarta right now. We have like very small um, uh, line of the bus line only. So this is, um, um, and also we see from the data, latest data about the, in 2034 that we have like the similar number of motorbikes and the people in Surabaya. So this, uh, this contrasts with the Kampung, most of the old uh, neighborhood in Surabaya. This contrasts our uh, um, with the uh, with the what's called with what on the road and what in the alley. So that is very impressed. Uh, what's called interesting to dig more about like how uh, how it works. I mean how how people manage to uh, the mobility and also the what's called the, uh, the spatial the space in the in the outside kampung and inside the kampung. So this is like the sites that Kampung Rapitan that we um, learn together with uh, local and also artists in um, in uh, like three months. Um, so this uh, uh, this is uh, provided by uh, official community center at the uh, Kampung Rapitan. Uh, as you, as you see, this is not different with the um, um, colonial maps in nineteen early nineteen hundreds. So this um, uh, the Kampung Rambitan actually not really have a significant change in terms of the structure or form of the Kampung, um, even the river and also maybe uh, also the difference is like the river is no longer as a river. But um, another funding is a very good one to like my first, um, I'm, I'm not really have a very good information about how this Kali Surabaya or Kalimas, we can also say people uh, Kalimas, um, uh, the river is already there since um, at least from the oldest map that I uh, saw is uh, in the 14th century. So that's, uh, so this is, and it's still there. So this is very uh, ancient, um, ancient river. But um, in the contemporary context and recent uh, people who live in the Pampitan uh, Kampung is a, um, is a detached from the river itself. But at least they put on the map. I mean, like this is very significant um, of a school portion of the Kampung itself. So this is already pop up by itself, the river uh, to show, please show, please visit us like that kind of the feelings when I saw the first map that given by the uh, community leader there. Let me check, oh, one, six minutes. <laughs> oh, uh, Anita, um, yes? four minutes. <laughs> four minutes, okay. <laughs> so this is like few methods that, um, uh, that I try to work on uh, as a program manager to make uh, to make sure to uh, what's called to make sure very good um, communication with local um, among local among uh, artists and also among the uh, non-human as a river and else. So this is like one of the best. Um, I feel like a best successful uh, method that I um, impose to the to the kampung is the collective walking with the. With locals with the Padjoko. and uh, this is like maybe the uh, like the important um, uh, mapping uh, that we do, like how the rivers um, um, involve with the Kampung uh, people in the contemporary context. So we're doing like um, uh, in Delhi, uh, Padjoko will um, take some plants along the river and and put on the Kampung, grow it in the Kampung. So that's why so we impress like the findings of the plants along along the river so another another method is a drawing this is like a few artists uh, use drawing as a, a method and also as the uh, result of the uh, work this is also important um, things that I saw that the artists do about the about the social representation the kampung as uh, one thing like Kampung Kampitan is the most cosmopolitan um, a multi ethnic Kampung that we still have in Surabaya. So this method is very uh, interesting to keep uh, working on this method. And that's, this is the like the very simple um, mapping that uh, for um, uh, the locals love to have a social gathering like a karaoke 
kalau ki uh, tujakan eating uh, like this one tujakan or maybe like very um, um just hang out but they make it like certain uh, certain um social cohesion or gossip or or we uh, me uh, as an outsider can see like who's the one who take the initiative who's the one who take the songs and who take care of the place where they get her so this is like with the everyday event it's very important for us like um uh, to see like how it works the kampung and this is important to put um i guess one thing that i want to like want to learn more about how these events can be scale to the to the city from the kampung to the city so that's um that's the last image uh, from me thank you everyone Thank you, Anita. So I guess, um, joking, I, I will just automatically continue. So, hey, yes. <laughs> hey, everyone. Um, thank you very much for joining the session. I was so honored to, to, you know, to be present here and in front of so many, I think, a wide range of audience. And also thank you so much for IIS, but also Humanity Across Border to, you know, to host this kind of exciting event to foster the kind of South-South <clears throat> dialogue, or what I call. So my name is Ming Tom. I'm um, currently teaching in Shanghai, so I'm speaking from Shanghai. But today, what I want to present is actually a, a, an already published methodological paper uh, on city. So it represents somehow like a shifting point from me trained as an architect and urbanist, but more towards somehow the urban studies. And um, so as I have trained as an architect and urbanist, so which means I have the kind of capacity or technological capacity to draw maps and maps in fact become a very important tool for all of our research and also reading a new kind of territory. But as I said, you know, I choose the cover image, which is representing somehow a turning point uh, back to 2017 when I was doing my PhD field work in Mumbai, in a slum in Mumbai called Dalavi. Um, so at that time, I, I started to thinking about this popular cartography as a methodology uh, emerged from the field work and from my interaction with the young people. So the drawing you saw here on the, on the right um, side is a drawing when I was waiting there for, you know, just waiting for the, because it was raining. So I kind of spontaneously started to talking with a young guy called Sam there. And somehow that he took over my pen and my sketchbook, you know, started to draw things and why explaining, uh, explaining me a lot of uh, local rules and also how he took uh, his friend walking around in Dalabi. So um, I think from a third party or third person, this map does not represent anything because it looks so messy. But somehow the this map was a uh, uh, with the narrative. It was a very very effective communication tool that was happening between us at that moment. So for those of you who do not know Dalavi, Dalavi is one of the Asians kind of like most famous or you know one of the biggest slum um, in Mumbai where you saw you saw all different kinds of representation. It has been also a very historical site which started you know way before the colonial time starting from a fishing village but now as you see the image it's grow it's become a super highly dense built up area, but the area is continuously moving because transforming because it is still, you know, under the discourse of rounds of redevelopment discourse or redevelopment plan. So often the redevelopment discourse, as we saw uh, just from this year, this March, that it's starting from survey, making the survey, making the plan and associating with, you know, all different other kind of policy and investments. So Dalabi as a place, has been um, under such kind of plan, authoritarian plan or state plan, or, you know, or from the kind of developers plan since the beginning of the 20th century from the British time until the most famous one was, you know, 2004, and, but it has been never kind of fully realized. But in fact, after 1980s, we also saw a different kind of um, rounds of plan making or map making, which is, um, initiated, often initiated and led by the 
uh, the kind of alliance between the NGOs, the activists with the community in Dalabi and engaging local schools. So this kind of um, counter mapping movement that emerged from the 1980s and especially in the 1990s and even today, I, I think Anita also you know, talked about the similar things in Indonesia that become a uh, who, who started to making other plans or other maps for Dalabi. But today what I'm presenting is a, a different kind of map, you know, from those two that I have just shown. Um, so I was working mainly with young people in Dalabi while, you know, the first part of my own research was focusing on the making kind of a plan or, or making the maps with the community because I try to understand how Dalabi has been, you know, gradually transformed over over um, one, 150 years. But when I encountered that young man and also, you know, when, when we started that kind of map, I started to really thinking mapping can be a, a different um, research methodology or a different ethnographic fieldwork tool that, you know, that helps me as an outsider to engaging with young people, like every individual young people rather than group of them. So across the field work, I have been interacting with more than 90 youth in Dalavi. But however, making a map is not a very easy task. So I only made around 35 maps over my field work, as you can see, that's from 2017 to 2019. So while, you know, making those kind of maps, there are several challenges, let's say. So the very first challenge is the starting point. Like when you ask people, could you make, could you draw me a map? And you got different answers. For instance, you got answers like, oh, you have a Google map, you know, you can use the Google map. Or oh, what, what, what kind of map? What do you mean? Like, so they often kind of, you know, this kind of question, when I ask this question, the question coming back to me, uh, ask for uh, kind of showing the concern on their ability to draw a conventional map, you know, that is something that should be accurate, proper, or professional um, in, in their world, or good map in their world. But then when I clarify that it is about your map, and they started to also, um, you know, started to discussing about, you know, in, in what size or in what scale that you want me to draw. Do you want me to draw the whole Dalavi or, you know, what kind of format do you want me? But I gave them total freedom, um, but then, I found that if you know if you just convince them and they started to join the map, that you just waited, the, the map will finish very quickly. But over the time, when you started to talking to them, or especially when they started to talking, when they are joining, the whole process becoming a very enriching process. You know, extending the join with a lot of details and narratives, and that uh, one space can be come back again and again during the narrative and adding more layers. Um, so this kind of, you know, discovery um, also bring another challenge is, is like when you collected this kind of mental mapping or, you know, the people's mapping drawn by the youth, how do you read them? Um, so I was really trying to understand the, the way they draw it. And I've discovered that, you know, unlike a um, conventional plan or a conventional map, which is often draw um, in a sense that this is a view from above, they, they combine both the view from within and the view from above to, you know, to unfolding their everyday routine within that map. But the map somehow it was a kind of synthesis of different routine together. But of course, you know, after joining this map together and conversation dialoguing together, we also had a lot of opportunities that, you know, that triggers a lot of other interaction, for instance, like working together or or some of them, they will take me to the to the space which they have, you know, drawn in the map, or they have mentioned in the map, and then we can elaborate on more discussion. So, so talking about the different kind of map uh, representing Dalavi, it brings me to thinking about the three fundamental questions. So, the first question is, what is a map? It's a it's an ontological question, and the second and third is an epistemological and methodological question about how is a map produced and how does a map work, and and I think these kind of fundamental question can can be connected to the the very recent or or the kind of literature review about cartography territories, but also about you know the critical mappings, counter mapping, which is. Um, appear like here and there over the world um, for 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 a long time. Um, in, I I, will, I don't have time to go into details, 
But what I'm trying to say is like we can see a diversifying mapping practice today, which is not only for certain purpose, but it's for a wide diversity of purpose, form and practice. And who are doing this? And they, they show a different kind of maps, which is you know evolving from the somehow the end products to to thinking map as a process. So the map itself can be evolving and changing and transforming. And the map can be, you know, mapping can be a process. Also mapping can be, so mapping can serve as a platform to engage a lot of different mappers. And when we talk about mappers today, it's no more professional limited, but it is rather popular uh, engaging many ordinary people that is become, they all become the mapper. So the question here now is for me, so my, my main argument is that mapping today is becoming, you know, it can should be reconsidered as an open-ended collaboration in which different mappers varies finding and funding acts that is, you know, working together to support the kind of co-production of the situated knowledge. So there are two key focus here. So one is about when we talk about uh, making a map, it is actually, especially in my case, you know, when I'm working with the young people, it is actually something, a collaborative knowledge production. Collaborative here means that we are not the same people. We are definitely have very different background and different capacity and knowledge. So our collaboration is based on the recognition of this difference. And that's how we should work equally together rather than me imposing something to, to the use or the use is you know, on the other way around. A second key point which I want to raise is about, you know, the collaboration uh, involving mapping practice, but understanding mapping practice as both, for both of us as finding and funding acts is also very important that, you know, helping what we got in the field work or in, in the action to thinking how shall we deal with that process and that process, that materials, and also how that materials can continuously evolving towards other forms. So back to my, 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 my picture, I want to uh, cite two very important also. So one is from the landscape architecture, James Connor, who was trying to show you, you know, for those who have the ability of mapping, what does the finding and the founding means? So the finding means that we're doing field work, we are observing from the field and, and we are extracting something from what we are observing and making relation, making meaning of idea or message throughout that. So this is all the maps has containing that kind of message or the artwork. Uh, but on the other hand, I think, um, so I want to cite anthropologist Tim Ingalls, who has made a very important uh, claim that, you know, mapping is a universal human capacity that's developed through the everyday inhabitation, which he thinks that map the finding is a kind of wayfinding for someone. So mapping means we are thinking of, of our daily routine, you know, how do we find our own ways in this changing environment in the cities? On the other hand, when I have to tell that experience to somebody, I have to make a story out of that. So you, you, you need to make a message through whether it is verbal or visual communication. Uh, with the message you want to deliver from that. So in that sense, uh, those mappers with different capacity all had this kind of finding and funding um, ability when they use map as a tool uh, and also, you know, when they use map and narratives together. So back to the popular category, what I want to, um, what I want to introduce today, uh, I summarize as their fourth step. But of course, with, with the time, yeah, so Johan is, is reminding me about time. So with the time I have today, I don't really have time to go into every of it. But what I'm just quickly showing how I was doing that. So first of all, doing my field work with all the youth I have interacted, um, I have actually documented the kind of interact, uh, interaction, the trajectory we had together, uh, you know, the whole different phase. You can see that this is a continuous interaction, especially from 2017 to 2020, uh, then within that, there is a very important step as well. We do that, you know, I call it dialogical mapping session. So this session involving, um, you know, that, that can be maximum for like three hours conversation, drawings, collaborative discussion together. And then there are also other interaction that is happening. But the key point is once that session has been done, uh, so you have a map drawn by the youth, and I, my interest was, well, that time was trying to see, you know, how 
this map is actually reflected on the kind of real scale of the map. But the thing is, um, if we're just plotting their maps, translating their map to the actual map, you don't see how the hidden knowledge transmission process happening. Because when they do the map, they don't do it in a linear way or in a very systematic way. They do it across different storytellings. And that storytelling is engaging many different places, many different narratives. And also they talk about their identity, they talk about the historical thing, they talk about their future things. And so, so these kind of materials, which was hidden often in the process when we're trying to reread or rewrite or redraw it, it's very important to show what's the real message they want to show. And also they were, you know, there are also something that they may not draw, but they were mentioned in their narration. For instance, when this place is really like far away, you know, they don't draw it, but they will mention it while they're talking about particular space on that. So the whole kind of process which I show on the step three was more or less a kind of a preparation phase um, in order to leading us to the kind of step four. So the step four here, I leave it open because I have my own way to, to you know, reusing these materials and also discussing again with the young people, but other people, when they saw the step three, they can also understand, you know, what has been um, kind of initiated there. But I want to remind that, you know, in the step four, or in how do we reuse these materials, whether it's about rejoining it or rewriting it in, in, in papers, uh, it is important to see what kind of message has been highlighted or selected, and also what kind of story that has been uh, shown there. So it's always about a selection. So my last slide is, I call it popular cartography, which I choose the word popular because I want to argue that this knowledge, it is generated from the field, from the people, but it's, you know, during that knowledge transition, it, we should still thinking about how that knowledge had, uh, got, if, got, if, um, how to say, got, um, tra transformed, but it somehow should still come back to the people. And then I, at the end, I think uh, Speedwax always have this very similar question for us, you know, how can the subaltern be heard? So the, the key message is that the subaltern or the marginal people is always speaking, but the way they're speaking, we need to also find a way working with them, making their voices to be heard. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anita. So, thank you, Anita. Uh, sure thank you, Anita. So, uh, well, sure to you. Uh, I want to thank also to well, uh, Joaquin and to Arti and everybody to be here. And everybody in this uh, to be quite here. interesting dialogue. In this is uh, quite interesting dialogue. Let me share my yeah, presentation. My, mine is a little uh, different. Mine is I mean, a little different. Uh, the approach is different, uh, different. but I think the, the approach is different. Uh, but I think main, the uh, uh, main um, uh, idea, the main. Uh, uh, the intention of recovery, these alternative uh, uh, mappings and ways of produce CD is more or less uh, shared. I mean, it's another case and with different approach, more historical, but we share this. So I will uh, talk about the case of the transformation of the basin uh, of our Valley of Mexico. Uh, I mean, the Mexico City nowadays that used to be uh, Tenochtitlan from the Aztecs. And the idea is to try to uh, study this as, a, I mean, not only maps, but representations in imaginaries in general, as a, a project, as a, a kind of uh, interact uh, and transform the space. So uh, is this uh, connected in that way with the previous presentations, but it's more historical, uh, I mean, it's like a, this cartographical historical approach. So I want to also to recover and that uh, which I mean was uh, talking about this uh, funding, finding mix. I want to, I recover the traditional classical idea of invention that it was a, a classical in this Latin world that it used also in the 16th century as inventium, inventio repertum uh, in, in to deal uh, to to report the novelty of the Americas, and this notion uh, conjoined the uh, now idea of discovery, but also of invention. That is, they uh, uh, don't, didn't distinguish between artificial production and natural knowledge. It is uh, used in both cases. 
So when they, they were a report of what we call the discovery of the uh, new world, they used the word inventis. No, and this is in the Columbus letter that we can find this. But also, for example, in the first time that the Americas was known, was uh, called with this name. In the Universalist Cosmographia of uh, Watson Muller, it is uh, said that uh, the first that uh, invented this land was Americo Vespuccio. So it's this idea that this is not uh, separated, uh, one, the nature uh, on one hand and the invent, the discord, the the inventions of the humans by others. This is together. This is a mix in this cre uh, creation representation of the of the world. So I use this idea also in the specific case of the transformation, uh, the representation and transformation of the basin valley of Mexico. I use this because it is also a conceptual, but also a material process. And it's like a, it used to be a basin. I mean, it was a closed basin that was transformed in an open valley artificially. And it was this, as I said, this uh, capital of the Aztec that is now the capital of Mexico. So when, at first, when the Aztecs arrived to this uh, promised land, that it was not really a, a land, it was a lake. It was a valley with uh, lakes inside that, it, as I said, it was a closed basin. They, uh, um, uh, built his city, their city, within the lake. I mean, it was something similar to this. But, I mean, they use also some kind of representation, so maybe maps, we can say, but this is a particular way of represented, represented uh, and also of uh, a storytelling. We can see is more or less the, the lakes, the uh, uh, people, but this also uh, uh, tell us the history of the pilgrims, the wars, the different stories are mixed in this map. So I think it's quite interesting to try to recover this uh, more practical approach of mapping. But I mean, anyway, we can see in a more traditional way that they uh, build also an artificial, uh, I mean, a city but also they transform the environment. So they build not only the city, but also roads uh, inside the lake, and also different dikes to protect the city, one uh, closer to the city, and all others that divided the uh, waters. Because it is a closed basin, it, was, uh, it, has, it had uh, too much minerals, so it was a salty lake, but they uh, built this dike to separate the fresh water from the salty ones. So in the first representation, European representation of the Valley of Mexico, uh, one uh, called Cortez map, we can see this, uh, I mean, the mix of a positive, but also a negative uh, representation of the city, which has uh, political, ideological implications, uh, justifying the conquest. We can see, for example, that it is presented the city and the environment as a Nazi mundi, I mean, as the center of the world, which was a positive uh, representation both for the indigenous and Europeans, but also uh, more uh, negative uh, elements. Uh, mainly, the human sacrifices is in the center of the, uh, the square, and uh, the flag of Hamburg is also like a, a, a trying to uh, um, proposing like a, the conquest of the city. We can see also uh, strategic information. For example, the Gulf of Mexico is also represented, that is the main entrance to the city. And the drinking water supply that Cortez recruit when he uh, attacked the city, and also he uh, uh, destroyed the, the huge tide that divided the water. So uh, uh, in other places, for example, we can see another kind of representation more positive, mainly in the uh, Venice environment, in Venice milieu, they were representing the city with different approach, without the negative elements, without justifying the conquest, in a similar way that they used to uh, represent the city of Venice. So we can see this, for example, in the mix that is made in the famous Jacobo de Barbary uh, Versailles view of the Venice, mixed with the uh, Cortes, represent, Cortes representation of the Valley of Mexico to generate this uh, Versailles view of the uh, Mexico City uh, by Alessandro Sorci. We can see also in different uh, books on islands, 
that they are uh, presenting the CED of Tenochtitlan in a better uh, uh, way, more positive. I mean, for example, now in the center of the CD, we can see uh, really a, a, sacri a human sacrifice. It looks more like an Vitruvian man, something like this, no? And all the positive elements of the well-organized uh, CD and also in harmony with the environment. The, this in comparison with Venice in a similar uh, Kind of representation. We can see also, for example, in the book of Tommaso Porcaki uh, that uh, represent both at the same time and says that not without wonder, we, we see another Venice in the world. So uh, we have different uh, representation with different uh, political interpretation of the environment and the city. Uh, returning to New Spain at uh, the middle of the 16th century, there were a, a heavy uh, season of uh, rainy that flowed the city. And the Viceroy consulted uh, different people, not only Spaniards, but also indigenous people that understand the matter as natives of the land and also indigenous lords that were asked for their old paintings. So they proposed to reconstruct the old dike to protect the city, but also to preserve the lagoon. We don't have uh, maps of these uh, consuls, but we have this map that is the Uppsala or Santa Cruz map that is contemporary. And we can see here that it is uh, not only uh, presented the uh, dike that were reconstructed, the one that is close to the city, uh, the small one to protect the city, but it is also represented the huge one that separated the waters. So more than a map, is a project. They are uh, uh, presenting this as a proposal to reconstruct the old way to deal with water management in the in the basin. So we can see also the uh, richness of the life of the water. I mean, the fish and uh, the bears, all the activities related with the lake, not only a uh, urban perspective. It, uh, we have both here. So later in the uh, 60, uh, in the 17th century, we have other representation that uh, it present another thing. We can see here the uh, dike that were reconstructed, the one at, uh, uh, above that uh, protect the city from the waters. But we can see another new aqueduct that was also constructed by the indigenous people. So uh, across the 16th century. We can see that uh, the water management, uh, indigenous water management was continued and it was taken into account into uh, uh, water management that, uh, uh, developed by the government, but also we can see it in these uh, maps. This will change with the uh, uh, 17th century when the indigenous people uh, declined and the Spanish settlers uh, acquired more uh, strong. And, uh, the indigenous uh, knowledge was uh, replaced by European technicians. So also we can see these changes in the uh, representation of the uh, CD and the Valley uh, uh, of Mexico. For example, in these uh, screens of Biombo of the, of the 17th century, which are more focused in the city. We can see here uh, almost an urban uh, city, a normal city, we can see a little of water in the corners, but I mean, the urban perspective is now dominated. So uh, in the same, at the same time, when we're uh, another uh, uh, season of uh, floods, the, the, the new Viceroy has another uh, once, uh, once again to the people, but this time only to Europeans. And they describe the waters as, as, as the enemy of the city. So uh, almost everybody was in agree that they need to uh, build a general and perpetual drainage, and it becomes more an uh, engineering problem. I mean, it's not uh, how to do with, uh, how to, uh, is, what was the best uh, water management, but only how to uh, create this drainage. So we can see now this in this map, uh, uh, painted by Enrico Martinez, Henry Martin, that it is uh, represented the lagoon, but also is focused in the uh, drainage uh, works. So we can see uh, to the left the uh, uh, drainage uh, works. It is only focused in the uh, lakes of the north, so it was small. It is not uh, 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 huge enough to drain all the lakes. What I mean is that the first intent. And we can see also in this representation the city is like isolated in, with a protection 
uh, uh, to the lake, to the water lake, uh, only uh, the drainage is what the only solution. Uh, later, when Alexander von Humboldt arrived to the city, they uh, complained also that the uh, Spaniards had uh, uh, reduced the lagoon by this drainage. And we can see also in this map that now uh, uh, Mexico City, uh, it is already in land. I mean, it is far from the lagoons. So this was also developed uh, uh, throughout the 19th century in a more um, uh, modern way. I mean, new engineers developed uh, a more acquired representation of the of the Valley of Mexico, now a valley because it's open, and we can see uh, the representation of both the city, but also the lakes. That it was uh, still there, but they were reduced uh, by this time. So we can see also another thing that they were uh, the when their land was going uh, dry. They develop uh, uh, real estate uh, businesses. So we can see this in these maps. We can uh, see all this part of more of the West that are not already built, but are uh, um, represented in some different uh, uh, structures in order to uh, create new neighborhoods. So they re uh, recover also the idea of the dike to protect the city because I mean it was already dry, but in uh, rainy seasons can uh, suffer also floods. So they recover once again the idea of build this dike uh, uh, to protect the city. But at the same time, but in the middle of the 19th century, we can find another uh, uh, projects more uh, uh, holistic that. Uh, trying not only to construct the drainage of the of the lakes, but also to use the water to navigation and to irrigation. But at first, they were not uh, carried out by lack of funds. And but anyway, they uh, try to deal with waters or once again uh, building dikes in order to uh, uh, to obtain more land uh, uh, to reclaim more land to the waters. But at the end, I mean, at the end of the 19th century, the project that was uh, really built was only the drainage. I mean, it was a huge drainage system in order to uh, uh, protect the city, but also to drain rain and all the sewage of the city in this huge uh, work. So, as I said, now really uh, real estate businesses uh, developed. Uh, anyway, they like the lake was still there. But it was uh, losing uh, uh, space, and the uh, urbanization uh, start to growing. That's we can see in this map. Uh, there is not now. It's uh, the this kind of better view has transformed in this representation. That is not only a representation; it's also a project to urbanization into uh, to uh, sell this uh, new uh, new uh, lands. At the same time, they develop the. Uh, they need to provide drinking water to the city and they take it, they took it from the south and they build also these huge aqueducts you know, that we can see here. So uh, it is like a boat. They took the water out at the same time that they uh, bring new water from other places. Anyway, they need to also to pump the water from the underground and they, this uh, causes the subsidence of the city. And with that, the system that uh, used to work by gravity, it is not, not useful anymore. So they need to, uh, I mean, we can see here that the uh, city, the city subsidies uh, made that uh, the system of the Grand Canal uh, didn't work. And they proposed to construct this deep drainage system. So it is a huge that evacuate all the water, rainy and sewage, all the time. And nowadays we have uh, improved this system and we have uh, constructed new, uh, new deep uh, drainage with the new fresh water. We, we, take, uh, we take the fresh water from other basins. And now we, are, we uh, create this huge geopolitan region that connects for uh, basins and move the waters 
that used to go to the Pacific Ocean to the Atlantic, to the Gulf of Mexico. So it's a, a huge uh, impact in the environment. So that's my idea that it is the invention, not only of the city, but also of the environment, this urban valley that, that we have in the Mexico city that has transformed this uh, lake environment in this uh, huge metropolitan and uh, urban area. But I mean, at the end, we have still some areas that have still some uh, lakes and some traditional waste produce. And now we have also this, uh, alternative ways of represented with 3D, the, how the city used to be. And it is very useful to try to uh, engage people to try to recover at least the parts that still are there of the lakes. So that's all. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, uh, Anita, Min, and Omar. Uh, I think this was a, um, this was a, a yeah, I mean, the, the fact is that you have provided us uh, the tools for visualizing um, epistemic erasure, overwriting, and recovery through walking, uh, drawing, and through sort of um, uh, excavating an archive of maps uh, over the long durée. And I wanted to also say that what you have done is uh, methodologically very, very uh, interesting for us, especially the juxtaposition of the three of you. So uh, somebody who's walking uh, and working and also a one-time resident of Plampitan, Anita was once a resident of Plampitan herself, so she knows the alleyways. Min, you have worked with the young people, but you have also uh, you have you are also an architect, so you engage with urban planning uh, uh, discourses uh, and national development and redevelopment projects and revitalization of Mumbai as a, a major metropolitan. And Omar, uh, you have been working also with cities and specifically with. Uh, I mean, Mexico, but specifically from the con uh, from the viewpoint of water, and especially in dialogue with European city of Venice as well. So, uh, and then you you bring in the colonial, uh, uh, and all three of you are bringing in the colonial um, uh, mapping and visualizing of the city. So, I invite uh, the three of you to uh, open the conversation um, and talk to each other across your regions. Um, and also with regard to your uh, methodologies and challenges and um, uh, advances. Thank you. Thank you. So maybe I can pose the first question. <laughs> Post your mind. See, we are a bit nervous here at the atmosphere. Um, so Anita, thank you. Thank you very much for the for your presentation. I, I mean, I was I'm super excited to to visit Surabaya and visit Kampong, you know, because I'm I'm kind of like a slum specialist <laughs> because I have worked uh, across different urban urban let's say the marginal communities in 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 South Asia and in in Africa. So my question would be because I always I think some of the um, audience also maybe asked the similar question. I I always had a bit not problem, but you know, when I was working, when I was facing activists, because in my case in Dalavi, that yes, there are lots of activists and NGO that is engaging with marginal population. But the thing is, when you're engaging with them, you cannot be nurtured. You have to select one, you know, with whom you are standing by. And in, in Dalavi, uh, the, uh, in my case, that the, the social composition is so complex that you cannot stand in with everyone, which means that you prioritize some certain communities while this prioritization you know working with them um somehow also recreate a new margin and so that was my observation and often in india so so that's why i think um my question would be when you when you choose to work with community like community is not um, a nurture or you know the same kind of word there is different people within that how do you choose among the community, or how do you choose people that who you want to work with, and how that would affect it, the the so-called content mapping, you know, the production of the content mapping, but also often content mapping are used to 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 against the state or against to counter something. So this is my question to Anita as a practitioner and activist. 
Uh, my question to Omar is that, you know, you have gone through all the historical, especially we are using like me, me too, like I often use the colonial maps and also the indigenous, so so-called indigenous maps together and making layers or, you know, to read across the city. But how, how do you think that would change the way that, for instance, if you are engaging with a new round of map making for the Mexico city, or, or especially for the development plan, how are you going to, to use that knowledge to the actual one? Thank you. I guess I can start to, to start the conversation. Thank you. It's, uh, it's also my first time to like the poll uh, to see a presentation of me and Omar. And this is also it's like we, we connect with the map, but it's totally like different focus. So that's it's very uh, it's very wide or uh, um what's called many uh, many perspectives that I can learn also. So that's uh, to answer a uh, question from me and it is um, actually, you said you're not the one who asks that. Everyone, most of everyone, most everyone, like uh, like who you work with. I mean, like as a, even like in Campo, um, uh, the Campo is considered yes, it's a well um, neighborhood. Considered as well, like middle um, um, a low middle class um, uh, society uh, in the Kampung Pampitan compared to other Kampung. So there's a um, um, but uh, but one thing that I um um believe in my like 10 years of uh, working more than 10 years working in Surabaya is that mostly I work with women that's a uh, um, but also even in women in Kampung they have also a separate circle so this is maybe like one I also navigate or mapping uh, with the women in Kampung but I guess one thing that common is from uh, them a woman they um they quite like often look in the also in our society so this is also really easy to connect with like the solidarity like the very basic one it, the basic one is solidarity you can all that that like the simple one like how you can travel around the city the uh, as a woman, I mean, that's maybe from the basic uh, question that I ask to them, and then that's um, that's the solidarity can uh, connect more days and days. Yeah, as I told before, I only like few months there, so it's just only days, days to keep like um, a change um, stories and else, and then uh, until um, and then it's just always. I feel like this is like the right one that I work with mostly with women in uh, at Kampung Rampitan until now also. There's um um so but I mean I guess it's no hard I mean for me it's no hard to do because like it's overlook uh, from the overlook of things that you can feel more solidarity compared to the uh first call compared to what mostly we will meet um the leader is mostly a man or even not the leader like most of the people outside uh, be a uh, bees in outdoor is also uh, mostly man. So, um, and also this is like my um, uh, also important method I use in Surabaya that uh, most of the other maybe activists or other visitors or visitors, they're mostly working with the man, most of, most of them. So this is also my counter narrative uh, in the urban issue in Surabaya. So this is also important that I always um, trust this um, way up to a uh, way to work with a woman. So this is maybe a sort uh, a sort <laughs> uh, respond from me. And then um, maybe I uh, want to ask you, uh, Min, uh, about the drawing. I mean, like even the map also, map drawing is also map. So this is also a question for the Omar. I mean, like drawing is, uh, not, is un right now in the contemporary context is unfamiliar of the expression. I mean, like you, we work with the, with residents, let's draw something, but it's still like uh, un not common, uncommon um, uh, methods also for drawing. We take photos right now, like why we use drawing? Uh, they said we use Google Maps, like why are we drawing map? So what what that can like um um uh what's called how you encounter with this um unfamiliarity with this method uh, for some uh, map or uh, Omar, I mean, I only learned about the colonial maps recently. It's just, uh, first, it's very hard to access as a non-academia. So this is that's why it's the um, it's the for me it's uncommon, a uh, drawing and map. So uh, please share to us like uh, how you respond with that. 
Roman, you can go ahead because you have two questions. <laughs> yeah, perfect. Thanks. Thanks for both. Um, yeah, first, uh, your question. Um, yeah, I mean, it's like a this should general overview was the idea very quick. But I mean, the idea is that also that it was like a useful uh, to nowadays problems. And I think that it is also another different approach. I'm I'm re the reco uh, recovery this uh, colonial, but also modern maps that it was created by the state with a vertical vision, and as a, um, uh, to try to understand the their use. I mean, their dynamics within uh, some colonial, uh, but also internal colonialism in the in the independent uh, Mexico. So uh, it is like a, this uh, play within the city. This is also that I want to ask you because I think that my approach is not uh, strictly urban because it is a city, but also the environment, the surroundings. And it is like a little this uh, uh, dispute between both, no? So, um, I mean, it is like a, this representation uh, of the of the city that used to be the prevalent, or this is the prevalent view, and creating these maps is for uh, preserve the city mainly. So the idea is to try to criticize this, and also to try to find other maps. That, that's the one, the, the indigenous map that I uh, presented. But nowadays, I think there are like other options that I'm not. Uh, I'm not now in Mexico. I am in Venice, so I need to go more in the land as you and to try to work more with people in the and the representation. But I can find also this three D recreation that I think it were were very useful. And the idea is to to the, uh, to recover. These other uh, perspectives, not only the urban ones, but also how the uh, city uh, impact in the surroundings, mainly in these lake uh, areas. So it was like a more this idea and try to uh, deal with water management in a better way in the Valley of Mexico. So by the other problem of the drawing in the I think that, that, that you are right. I mean, this is like a, also this uh, gap. I mean, it's all not only the representation. I mean, the way that the mapping is doing, but also who uh, can uh, deal with the map. I mean, who uh, go to the archive and how we deal with this. I mean, it, because it's used to the the work of an architect or an engineer or maybe a politician. No, but people is not really engaged. So th my idea is a little more this. I mean, the, try to do more or less what you are doing with maps and with people, but more in the archive. I mean, to recover these uh, approaches in order to disseminate it with people and how people uh, uh, understand that, but also how they are creating uh, another representation. I mean, with maps. But also the in the imaginary or the how they conceptualize the space in a different way, uh, more from a local perspective. Maybe not the exact uh, the same that the people that live in the city in the center of the city if they live in the surrounding areas. So it is like more like this. Try to uh, yeah to recover these other visions that I think is connected with your work. So should I answer Anita's question? Um, so you, you're talking about drawing as an unfamiliar method. Yes, I totally agree that this is why I, so I particularly put a slide and also in my paper, there is a whole section about reflecting. It is how awkward, you know, that you just go to the field and ask someone to draw me a map. So in my cases, um, the mapping session actually happened not in the very beginning when I was interacting with someone. It's definitely happened already up, you know, after we met several times or so we have talked about um, interacted several times. And, and so so the mapping, so the first thing, the mapping were not, um, I would say, so, so in order to make the mapping session happen and make it lasting at least or two hours, this requires certain um, suitable time and place. So for instance, we only do the map um, at the place which is selected by the by the youth, so where they feel comfortable and they have time at that day to do that. And and so for me, it's not about drawing itself, but it's about how drawing is combining with narratives. So so it's about you know the verbal storytelling that is 
assisted with drawing because when we talk about stories, sometimes, especially for the youth that I'm engaging with, some they are not like most of them they are not like well educated, so, so they don't know how to properly tell a story. Actually, you know, in a in in like a talk show style and they were also not very confident for their English in many times and as long also in the same time they were not very confident for for their drawing that's why they was asking me like they cannot draw a proper map of Dalabi or proper map or a professional map of Dalabi which you know you have to have a scale you have to have all these um rules so what what's but in the end what I found is that you know why I'm arguing um, from Tim Ingold, the anthropologist side of, you know, everyone has this capacity of drawing. When the drawing is combined with narration, it serves for helping for your storytelling. Everyone has, you know, this wonderful way of finding their own ways of drawing, whether it's about lying or whether it's about writing the word, or whether it's about writing small signs. So I found this fascinating that I do not give them a unified uh, rules of, of how to draw, but it is really 100% up to them, you know, in which way they draw. And when they draw, they, they often turn the table, uh, turn the paper, and they add the paper, because when they draw, it's about when they are thinking back to the, the time, the story they are telling. And, and also, I think one of the good um, things for drawing is about, you know, because for photos, you have pretty limited. You have to take the photo, you have to print out the photo. And 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 when they talk about spaces, mm -hmm. for instance, like when they talk about their grandmother's home in the suburb mm -hmm. or in the, in another um, another region, you, you don't have that photo to show up. But on the drawing, you can just simply mm -hmm. refer and you just draw a square or something. So I think the drawing and in combining with storytelling really helped many people who are not good at drawing or who are not good at telling the story that, you know, to 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 become excited, actually. Sometimes, like, I, I do not hold the time saying that, okay, we do one hour or, you know, two hours, but sometimes it's just naturally lasted for three hours. <laughs> yeah, so so I think that's, that's a really something I have um, tested with many young people who are, who are not, you know, professional, who are not, that's why I think everyone has the capacity, but it, it has to happen on the right time with the right person. So you cannot do that with everyone that I have to admit. Thank you. If I may uh, ask a question to one or which of you, and if you want to, uh, Ming, I, uh, I was wondering a little about this uh, concept of the funding and funding. Because I, 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 as I said, I tried to make something similar with this idea, classical idea of inventio. But I, my question is more like a, how the, the, the people, uh, when you inter interview them, they are uh, conscious of this. I mean, because I think that this is more this uh, uh, theoretical approach, no? But I mean, maybe they are conscious. I mean, I, no, my, my question is more like a, they have this uh, traditional separation between us, uh, representation, uh, or when they speak about this, they are also uh, assuming that they are generating something new or not. I mean, it's more like a, they uh, have a more modern traditional approach with this separation of their have more, in when they develop these uh, maps, uh, an idea that is mixing more, both uh, uh, dynamic, no, the funding and the funding. And uh, Anita, I, uh, um, since my approach is more related with the water, I mean, I make my interpretation more in the conflict between the city and the lakes and the, uh, the people of the lakes. But I mean, in your case, that it is a river, I don't uh, know how is the relation with the uh, I mean, the people near the river and the and the city, as as I said, maybe it's not, a, I mean, so opposed, I mean, as in my case, because I mean, the river crossed the city, no? And so I think this is a different relationship. I don't know. Uh, I'm not sure if I could just summarize the question in one sentence. <laughs> Yeah, and oh, all, no, only is that this uh, notion that finding funding is, mm, I mean, I of course, you recover from this uh, author, no? 
But what about the people that you work with? I mean, it's that they assume the traditional separation between a representation and then something else that you can count, no? And they are in the in this process. They uh, connect and they have this more integrated uh, vision that this is at the same time a, a find and a fault. Um, so for my interlocutors, they don't, they actually don't care about this academic <laughs> discourse about finding or funding, but it is true that, you know, there, because I also saw a question who was asking about how the people, how the mappers were, you know, use that map. So, so for them, I think it's, um, so I did not develop this map for any kind of, you know, counter, I don't want to counter someone, but for me, it's, it's, it's more important that, you know, these, these stories, which is often invisible or undercovered, and especially for young people who does not really have a voice in those redevelopment projects, because those projects is often, you know, focusing on the community identity or the land centric thing. But, but I think the, the funding and funding, especially when, when the youth, um, you know, when we had this kind of dialogical session, um, they, they had a chance or they were surprised about how they are good at drawing things and how they could actually talk so fluently about their stories. So, so I think that was one of my, I, I mean, purpose or, you know, that, that, you know, they were so happy and some of them, because some of them, they are the migrant workers. So they were so happy saying that this is a proof of my, me living in Mumbai, my, my, my kind of fighting my life in Mumbai. So I want to send this back to my mom. So, so, so I think that's, it's not me who should control, you know, how they are finding or funding things, but in the end, you know, with that's what has been produced. I think there are a lot of exciting stories and um, that's makes me to thinking I, I can use them to refining or refunding thing. That's why I use the rejoining, rereading and uh, rewriting. So for instance, I was really curious about the idea of public space. I was curious about the idea of home. So there are a lot of things that I could develop further after I had all these materials, but today, because it was more on the methodological focus, so I did not really show in that part. Thank you. Uh, Omar, I mentioned you on the chat box and also maybe uh, there's a similar question also from the audience. Uh, thank you. It's a very great question about the river, uh, especially about the main river in Surabaya, Mass River that next to the Kampung is part of the Kampung. I believe that. But uh, for the condition right now, it's like you can just, yeah, it's a stress bin. <laughs> So the title of, uh, I really love the title. I mean, like, it's very described what the condition of the river right now. So they just throw the the dead dog on the river. So that's, um, but but in our recent collective book with the locals, it's a totally makes different uh, perspective for me in that certain was called part, like maybe uh, 500 meters. We walk along on the, on the river uh, bank. We find many leaf things. I mean, like the, the jasmine, uh, jasmine water, uh, banyan trees, any kind of trees that I can imagine that can live from that polluted, heavy polluted water. Um, so that's, um, um, uh, because like in the only uh, like two years, I start to uh, research about the river from the colonial maps, about the canals, the river, that's the uh, the main um, infrastructure they built uh, first uh, during the colonial times in the 17th century, the canals and the, and the river. So this is like the, uh, this, um, uh, this finding about the revival of the river is a in front of our eyes, but we not really uh, think about the uh, what we can do after. I mean, like uh, because like uh, mostly the municipal government, government uh, sorry, by municipal only use the river right now only for the um, uh, tourism. I mean, like they they have the small boat to take the tourists along the heavy polluted water. That is so. This is only the option right now. The citizens to connect with the river. So this is very important uh, methods that, that, that um, that's, I believe is very successful, uh, the methods of the collective work with the, uh, with the local around the river that I, I really want to continue more like along the river. We have like 20 kilometers um, 
the length of the river from the south to the north to the port uh, area. So this um uh, that is that is very good findings. Um, um I need to like uh, uh do it more, <laughs> do it more <laughs> to walk along the river. So this is a really great project with the um uh, citizen of Surabaya. I guess it's a uh, many question from the chat box. I'm very <laughs> Yes. Uh, oh, if I can uh, jump in really quickly. Oh uh, what can help us? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, so uh, for the sake, uh, we have a few minutes. Uh, so there are a lot of questions. Um, and I can see I've, I've been checking the chat as uh, everyone has been talking. There are some discussions already. But we will, not, we will read them out, not everybody. Yeah, so uh, because of the time, we'll read out some of the questions here. Um, we won't be able to get to everyone, unfortunately. But um, if there are further questions, I think we can reach out to um, uh, you, you can we can reach out to myself or our speakers if they're willing to share their emails. But uh, we'll start with a few questions. Um, as I said earlier, uh, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat. It's very difficult if we ask uh, people on video call saying it uh, over there. So uh, one of the questions I had seen here that I don't think was necessarily touched on yet uh, was, um, was from Zifan Meng. Uh, I was wondering why, uh, I think this is targeted to Min. I was wondering I why you chose the youth. I guess the question, I guess, connect with me and, and me about the quantum mapping question. I guess that's maybe the um, important um, um, a question uh, for me and, and us, if I may propose. Oh, I'm sorry. Wait, sorry, Anita, could you please repeat that? I didn't quite catch that. <laughs> sorry. Uh, the question about the quantum mapping, I guess that's the key that uh, those key to, uh, that keywords uh, with me and uh, myself use that keywords uh, to uh, in our research. I guess that's uh, I guess that's an important question for uh, two of us. Yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. I have I have actually briefly written if. Uh... I mean, I just pointed out the keynote. So, so you were about to reading one question, right? From the Zifan Meng. Yes. Yes, I I can yeah I can I can answer that without yeah. you reading. If we can save time. Wait. Oh. Uh. Wait. Sorry. Uh. Okay. Sorry. I think it's best if you hop in here for this. Uh. I'm May I suggest that that Anita answer the question on counter mapping, uh, because that's important. It's a generic question that has come up, uh, and Anita, please go ahead, and then we take oh. some of the other. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but actually, maybe that's uh, from this presentation. Ming used that key keywords, but I thought uh, Ming, please, please also add uh, put your uh, answer also to this question. Uh, for the for my part, I do uh, other research. So this is uh, I did not yet uh, share on this one the keywords. I, um, but I'm for me I use this uh, quantum mapping. It's this new keywords. It's only in nineteen early nineties, um, often by Nancy Peluso, especially for the do the mapping in the indigenous um, uh, people in Kalimantan. So this is also growing like the uh, discourse about this uh, quantum mapping, especially for the urban. Uh, urban issue from so I use these uh, uh keywords and methods also to use the uh the quantum mapping as a as as a pendatang uh, what's called in pendatang in English I forgot that and newcomers uh, newcomers in the city as also as a woman as to, to see to be part of the city so that is I guess we can use quantum mapping in the various um um um, um case not only for the indigenous one or not. Um, uh, not only for the, we can use like a for uh, a for several uh, for a variant of the for a variant of the case or perspective also use this uh, this keyword. So I'm um, in recent years I use this uh, keywords also to let's go to tell us others uh, that what 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 we are doing right now. So that's uh, maybe uh, I mean please share your yes. idea. 
I think I have written also, I had a slide, you know, showing how this evolution of mapping practice happens and also how that occurred in the scholarly debate. So I, in my paper, I have a very detailed review on that. But for me, I think the counter mapping, when it's first emerged, it's representing a whole kind of movement of activists trying to working with community and they're especially working, you know, fighting with the state, using mapping as the state tool. But, you know, they produce the same kind of map based on the community's knowledge in order to, you know, negotiate with the state. So for me, this is like the round of counter mapping, which present their the 1.0 version, the first version. But my, as I already say that, you know, the reason I choose work with the youth and especially I choose work on the everyday uh, experience, everyday practice is that, you know, the map I produce is not necessary fighting for the land centric things. And also today we are evolving, I think, at a stage of counter mapping 2.0, which means the, the kind of everyday knowledge, everyday stories, the micro history, the, the micro stories we produce is not necessarily used to, you know, to counter fighting immediately for something, but it is definitely a counter mapping or a counter story, which is existing outside of the state meta narratives so these everyday um narratives in the, in its form in the in the form of map or stories i think they are enriching our understanding of understanding the city how city is lived through not how city is you know built up um, on, only in the eye of state but it's not necessarily something linking to you know fighting for my land um rights so so that's i think a fundamental difference here between when the counter mapping narratives emerged and also how it is happening today, because there are also other words like radical map, um, different words emerge, different concepts emerge. But now I think uh, we we are doing the maps that we are co-producing something because not because I'm trying to represent the youth in order to arguing for their rights. So I think that has been kind of changed in in many, in many other uh, practices. Thank you, Min. Okay, um, <laughs> I'd like to jump in here really quickly. Uh, I saw a few questions um, directed towards uh, Omar, and I wanted to ask if there were particular ones that he wanted to expand upon. I saw he was answering a few in the chat. Yeah, sure. Uh, which one did you say? Oh, well, I'm looking at the most... Uh, I'm looking at the most uh, recent one, but is, is there any particular question that you see here that uh, you'd like to answer? Because I did check everything in there, really, because it was too much. Um, I... uh, here, maybe the uh, the there is a question here about um, your proposition for solving the problem of in, imminent climate change in uh, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, if I can, uh, yeah, a little of the discussion that uh, we uh, Ming was uh, talking. It was also my, my idea, for example, was invent invent you. It was like this. I mean, it's not like a uh, there is not such a, a neutral map. It is like a, an intervention. It is like a, something that I recovered others uh, uh, put it uh, outside. So it, this is like a, this uh, idea of how we could construct. I mean, it's, it's an invention that way. It's a, a construction of the environment of the city. I mean, it's not that, that something that it is outside. It is uh, constructed, but it's also a political decision. So which kind of city or which kind of environment we, get, we want to live in. So the idea to, to try to solve the climate change problem in my perspective, it's more uh, related with the uh, uh, city and environment and water. It is more like this idea to uh, try to avoid uh, uh, extractivist approaches in, in, in that way to take into account the vision of local communities and also uh, to try to avoid the uh, opposition between the city as the, with this. Uh, Always with this uh, dynamic of uh, extractivist uh, dynamic of the environment, um, within the case of the water, it's clear this, in, at least in Mexico City, so uh, to try to build a more plural, more uh, less uh, uh, polluted, and with a less impact in the environment in general. I mean, but the solution should be a local one. I mean, you know, I start for, for, from there at least. 
I have a question uh, for all three of you. I was just wondering how um, uh, each one of you has dealt with the question of, uh, so when we look at mapping as a collaborative exercise, um, a col uh, um, how did you deal with the issue of power? So even in your case, Omar, the question of um, to produce a map that was in agreement with the indigenous people and the colonial masters, how did they come to that agreement to be able to produce a map together and to agree on that? And similarly for Min, you have already talked about that in your paper, but maybe just for the audience sake. And also for you, Anita, I know you talked about the gender dimension, and uh, but there is, of course, uh, an inequality in, uh, in the collaborative exercise of mapping as well. So uh, maybe maybe if Omar, you start, and then Min, and then Anita. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thanks. Um, yeah, I, I, maybe my presentation, it was like a oppose this vision from the city and from the lakes and the surroundings. Uh, the idea is that, uh, or at least in this historical review, we can see that sometimes uh, even the uh, uh, Spanish government and the local uh, government in the New Spain uh, took into account indigenous uh, water management and water uh, and, uh, and projects to deal with water. So the idea is that it's not, uh, we can see this uh, uh, conflict. What I mean is not that it's uh, always a black and white, a, a clear opposition or a line that's right. The idea I think also is to try to implement in a more general way, I mean, uh, in a politics, uh, public pol uh, 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 politics, this more plural and more uh, also, uh, ecological approach. I mean, it's not uh, yeah, to try to generate this, not uh, within the opposition with, within a state and, and, and people or communities. So uh, it's also a question uh, for both. Uh, how do you think the, this uh, counter mapping is uh, the relation with the, the, the state could be? Thank you, Archie, for this very, very important question. Um, in my case, I think why I started to thinking about the popular cartography is really like I have shown that in the field, like it's not so easy to ask someone actually to draw a map for you, right? So there is power relations between you and your interlocutor. And, and exactly there is kind of personal relation also developed through your interaction. So. Um, so that's, I think, one kind of power relation we have, like as a researcher in the field, that's, you know, how much these things had been prepared or, or you know, decided by yourself. And then you, you are kind of the organizer. And then, you know, when you interpret the material you had, you kind of doing your own selection to make your own argument. So I think this is quite problematic when it is not transparent, because um, I, I cannot deny that, you know, the knowledge gets transformed and always it's always get transformed from the field from your writing from your rejoining from your rereading but the thing is like uh, the 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 popular cartography which i want to extend is reach really to show you know at least on the preparation field especially after the field work you need to show this unspoken thing that you need to show how the um the the your interlocutor rather than your informant started to come like started started to compose their story and how the story is composed and this is why when i was first do the rejoining i i put numbers on the space because the number on the space actually representing how they re, how they draw it in order and how that is related to the narrative they are talking about so this is my way of dealing of this kind of power relation showing you know like here is the the materials and and also i was really particularly paying attention when i was you know i don't give over give instructions but i only be a communicator with them so they talk about their story i post some questions but then post the field work i'm trying to show the process you know like as it is and when i try to make an argument from that i i can show that this is what is their stories and how i pick up the material from there so this is um, my way of dealing the power relation, but of course it's not like 100% perfect also, but I think there are a lot of discussion in the academia cycle right now talking about these ethical questions 
about doing, you know, the, between the field and post field writing. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ati, for the question. It is actually it's still like um ongoing process also for myself to as a part of an uh, outsider. Uh, um, but also at the same time, uh, we share that um uh, the same um a uh, concern. Uh, so that maybe can keep connect, continue to connect or continue to build the solidarity uh, among the uh, residents of Plumpitan. So this is, uh, for so this, this uh, inequality happened since first, because like for the for the event, for this Kampung uh, Plumpitan event, I come from the university, from Ireland University, and also that is already like, um, a make certain um, inequality, I mean like, and also like with the, uh, with the, with the idea we have like to bring our programs to the to the kampong itself but i guess this is really helpful with the method of they also help us at ab also help us to exercise um a variant of the me method that um um must go uh, exercise to minimize the gap of the inequality it will not happen in the in the uh, three months for sure but it's very good exercise for us a local of uh who uh, would um, we are the one who live in the Surabaya. If we, we live in a different uh, neighborhood, for so that's a, that's also um, um, have to know that's uh, the point that I always be a uh, pendatang, the the outsider. But I mean, like even in the kampung itself, there's also um, inequality also happen. I guess that we can uh, uh, I can I can like feel like the connection of that. Um, uh, that perspective, the inequality that happens in Kampong and also inequality in the city, inequality um, on uh, me and also the local residents. So that's, I guess, it says that this course actually is very great to exercise in the city. I guess the importance of this, uh, to make this event, to make this project. Uh, for so this is not will be, I mean, like, um, um, is the Kampong Kapitan uh, need this program? I mean, like, is that... Uh, um, or need the research of the content mapping research, but I, um, I guess is that one of the problems um, that we can not problems. I mean that what are the findings or the uh, the issue that already have or uh, um, layers of, because like the campus is already like 14th century that also can bring to the city level. I guess that's a um, um, my part as the activist um, urbanist also that's a, bring bring this to the to the city level. So that's just maybe um, the intention also important, Arti. I mean, you, um, it's just, um, um, it will be, but like, I mean, like sometimes like peer friends say, like, why you do this? Like, why, how, how we can start the uh, working with the people of the kampong? There's a lot of barrier from, um, uh, happens also, yeah, academia and academia, and, but it's, I guess, um, we need to like keep do this exercise um, 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 from now. I mean, like um, what what else? Oh, like why we need to wait to the perfect method to work with? I mean, like that is not it works the production of knowledge um, in our society. Thank you. So uh, I'm gonna have to cut this here for the sake of time. Um, thank you very much, Omar, Min, and Anita for coming in and having a conversation about mapping. Thank you very much to our team. And thank you very much to our audience for coming in. I understand that, uh, well, there was a lot of um, conversations also happening in the chat. <laughs> so uh, I hope that most of the people's questions got answered, but, uh, and if, uh, you wish uh, if if you wish to share with anyone who missed the conversation today, there will be a uh, video recording available on the IES YouTube channel, and it would also be sent to the people who had registered for this conversation. So thank you very much to everyone, and have a wonderful morning slash afternoon slash evening. Thank you. <laughs>